Hey, Fitheads, you're tuning into another episode of Sharing Our Pairings. This is Sharing Our Pairings, episode 104, Sober Mesa and Whiskey. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon. Sharing Our Pairing is broadcast around the world, picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network, and of course, broadcast at CigarFederation.com, broadcast on YouTube.com, and broadcast now on Facebook Live. So thanks for all our listeners on Facebook, YouTube that are listening in live. You can get your questions in either by pasting them on YouTube, you can paste them on uh, Facebook. You can, of course, go to Cigar Federation uh, event page there, paste them on Cigar Federation, or even in chat. We've got a lot of different ways you can get your questions in. We appreciate your questions. Sharing Our Pairings is brought to you by Gurkha Cigars, makers of the world's finest cigars. Go down to your local B&M, check it out. They'll have a Gurkha that's right for you. They've got a lot of Gurkhas out there. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Trippy Trent. Trippy, what's going on on this uh, Wednesday evening? Hey, hey. It's, uh, it's rainy, kind of not too cold here, not too warm. Same typical, season. yeah, typical uh, April weather for us. Mm. Hopefully, it'll start warming up pretty soon. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of that sort of dismal April, foggy, rainy spring kind of. You know, it's at least it's not snow. That you know, at least it's yeah. not snow. Absolutely, yeah. So what's what's going on for you lately? Uh, not a whole lot. Kids have been busy. I mean. We're at this point now where, like, my son has something going on almost every night, and he's mm. four. He's not even like in school yet, and we gotta take him places almost every day. Busy it's crazy. You are. Yeah, I just work. That's all I do. <laughs> Tough life. So, of course, uh, this is a show where we pair cigars and beverages. Tonight, we're pairing whiskey, as per the title, and of course, as per the title, we're sm- more smoking the Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust Sober Mesa, the cigar that kind of took this. Took the industry a little bit by storm last year. Uh, well, I guess actually two years now because it's not 2016 anymore. So it was the release in 2015 at the IPCPR. And I think, you know, because that was sort of Sokka's big return. He was the uh, the master blender for Drew Estate, left Drew Estate, uh, had a couple years off, and then started his own project, which is Dumbarton Trip at Tobacco and Trust. And I would say I love the Sober Mesa, but I think a lot of people were expecting sort of the Mi Carita style of cigar when he had his initial release so i think this one maybe surprised a lot of people yeah it's it's a completely different direction than pretty much everybody was expecting from him Mm -hmm. uh everybody expected you know dirty broadly rustic um and what we got was something just as uh intense of an experience i think uh but a little more refined um and just layers and layers of complexity in this cigar and I, I think that's the key word i know that when we talked about this cigar when it originally came out and we talked about it a year later when he came out with the new vitolas complexity was the word we kept using because it is a very like if you look at the specs and we'll get into that in a second but you look at the specs of the cigar it's got a lot of lajero in there i mean it's oh, yeah. got it it's got asp lajero in there and normally that should just blast you but there's so many layers of complexity to this cigar. Yes, it's full-bodied. Yes, it's strong. But it doesn't really come. It's very sneaky. It's very sneaky. It comes across as just a, you know, a creamy, balanced cigar. And, and you know, it might sneak up on you. But um, it's fantastic. And, of course, uh, I'm smoking the Short Churchill, which I think, if I remember correctly, Steve said it was Poco Mas Intensa. Was that right? Was that on yes. the short church? So Pokemon Intensa um, really blended for his palate to be just a firecracker of, of intensity, really. So he's, he's actually got a specific story about it and mm-hmm. it, a very specific reason why he created it um, that hits kind of close to home for me in like Drops a, some knowledge, in a palate way. Uh, so when he started, when the Dirty Rat, like when he blended the Dirty Rat, it became his breakfast cigar every single day he would well maybe not every single day but as his story goes he would smoke a dirty rat with espresso every single morning probably every day probably every day that's what i would guess um and he says that he got down to his last like i don't remember how many but it was his last like 40 boxes or something um and an interesting thing about steve that i think we may have talked about before is he will not smoke anything from Drew Estate that was made after he left, that at least not that existed before he left, just because he doesn't want to form an opinion, um, which I can respect. It's classy. Yeah. But he's getting to the end of his dirty rat supply from those days. (laughs) And so he needed to make something that would be his everyday morning cigar. uh, And that's the short Churchill. 
Which is, I mean, if <clears throat> if you're going to have a reason to blend a cigar, blending a cigar because you want to smoke it every day is probably right around the best reason you could have to blend a cigar, frankly. Yeah, and and for me personally, the short Churchill hits my palate in a way that I could smoke it every single day. Um, yeah, yeah, it just, yeah. just hits my palate. Just we right. were, yeah, we're kind of talking uh, pre-show in the green room, as it were, about how many short Churchills we've smoked. And uh, I, you know, I was I was very fortunate because I just assumed I had a short Churchill because I've been smoking them like crazy. But I'm actually down to my last two. And I think you said you've gone through an equal share. Yeah, I've gone through about two and a half boxes. I bought a couple of five packs and uh, I think it's two boxes. It might have been three worth (laughs) with the five packs. Um, But at least two and a half boxes uh, are, are down because of me. So I need to put another order in because I ran out. I'd say that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good endorsement. And I, I also, I'm going to have to get a bundle or a box because, uh, you know, I'm reminded of why I like it. I actually introduced somebody last night in a little private whiskey tasting to the Sober Mason. He was like, this hits my palate exactly. And I was like, well, let me introduce you to the meat Corita now that you've tried the Sober Mason. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, this is equally as fantastic just in a dirty, dirty way. And I said, yeah, that's, I mean, they're both excellent cigars. Mm-hmm. A little bit about the specs, talking about the uh, Silver Mesa Short Churchill. It's uh, four and three quarters by 48 Parejo. That's right, 48 ring gauge. That's what a Short Churchill is. Churchill. Uh, Churchill, Short Churchill. Um, I'm going to read off the specs here because the nice thing about Steve is what you see is what you get. And if you ask Steve a question, he'll just answer it. He's not going to bandy around the answers. He's not going to, you know, obfuscate. Uh, he's going to give you all the information. So for the Kappa or wrapper, it uses a Lameca Ecuador Habano number 1 Rosado. For the capote or binder, it's a Maracapa Negro de Temporal. Uh, for the tripa or fillers, it's a Nica GK Condega CSG Seco Pueblo Nuevo Creo Viso, a La Jolla Esteli C98 Viso. Uh, the Lajero is an ASP Esteli hybrid, which, you know, love that ASP. Oh, yeah. And then uh, just because, you know, you need that Poco Mas Intensa, it's got a whatever amount of leaf of USA Lancaster County broadleaf Lajero in there just mm. to give it a little bit of oomph. Yeah, and I find it really interesting that there are a lot of manufacturers that will tell you what country the filler comes from, for example. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of con- uh, manufacturers that will tell you specific, like, you know, amounts of Lajero and stuff like that. Not many people are telling you the farm, the specific priming and all of those little details. Um, and I would, I would bet money that not many people could take those leaves and go recreate this magic. Well, and I suspect that's exactly why. I mean, you know, Steve understands tobacco and he understands that, look, if you want to have 15 years, 20 years, 25 years of tobacco experience and try and reproduce the blend that I've got here with all the leaves that I've listed, have at her. But, mm-hmm. you know, good luck because it's very, you know, just because you have the ingredient list doesn't mean you can cook. Does Just because yeah, you have the exactly. ingredient list doesn't mean you can bake. So I don't think Steve worries about that at all. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think he's worried about somebody stealing his blend. And that's why he does something like give the exact blend. <laughs> and what are, you, uh, what are you smoking this evening? Uh, I've got the Robusto Largo. Which nice. is, let me look up the size. It is a five and a quarter by 52. Nice. So it's just a touch bigger. And from what he says, this one's a little less Lajero than that one. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I assume it's the same tobacco, it's just slight ratio just changes. Tweaks, yeah. And I mean, you know, with all the Lajero in this, and maybe, it, maybe it's just because I love being Lajero punished. But I mean, I'm retrohaling this probably every other, almost every draw, and it's not killing me. Like, I mean, it's not a pepper burn through the nose. It's just, it's creamy. It's got that great oomphy lajero complexity. There's some chocolate. There's cedar. There's just nuances of, of creaminess and sweetness, and it's all balanced. It's just, it doesn't come across as this, you know, powerhouse cigar because it's just, it's balanced, and that's probably why we smoke so many of them. Yeah, I would think so. Um, and I get like a really weird, like not quite licorice note. It reminds me a little bit of like oh, yeah. sarsaparilla or something yeah. like that, on the, specifically of- on the retro hail. Yeah. Now that you've said that, see, that's why it's good yeah. to talk about this stuff. Yeah, now exactly. That you said that, it's in my head. It's like a, it's like a, if you just licked licorice, that's the hint of mm-hmm. like an anise licorice quality. 
So, of course, we are doing a whiskey pairing tonight, and if you've ever met Steve or had the fortune of spending time with Steve, then you would know why, because Steve loves his whiskey. Uh, specifically, he likes Lagavulin. <clears throat> now, I don't have any Lagavulin Distillers Edition, but if you want to check out the interview, uh, the IPCPR, not last year, uh, but in 2015, you can see the cameraman, me, having a little bit of Steve's Lagavulin Distillers Edition at, I think, 9.30, maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And you can watch the camera angle. You can watch the horizon level kind of start to tilt as the uh, as the whiskey starts to take hold of me. And it's kind of a testament to the deliciousness of Lagavulin. But in honor of that, we are going uh, whiskey tonight. And uh, I'm going to kick it off here because uh, I love whiskey. Oh, and yeah. I'm going with a classic. And I featured them on the show before. It's the classic McCollin 12. Now, they've, uh, they've got a few different new offerings to the McCollin 12. Um, in the past, I've kind of given them heck for the fact that they moved away from age statement. They weren't producing 12-year for a while. They stopped producing 15-year. But it looks like they are coming back with a variety of 12 years. Uh, this one is my favorite and perhaps a miss a mismatch here for the blending or for the pairing, but I've gone with it anyways. I don't care. And this is my favorite McCollin expression in the younger years. And it's the 12 year double, double cask and it's a sherry oak cask. And I love the sherry 12. This is really the whiskey. One of the whiskeys that got me into scotch whiskey. It's like the gateway whiskey for me right up there with Highland park. Uh, I was never a big fan of Glenfiddich in the, in the lower years. I was never a big fan of Glenlivet. But McCollin Highland Park kind of got me kicked. So I've always got room for a McCollin 12 Sherry on my shelf. You can see it's got that it's got that nice sort of golden amber Sherry color, which I expect with some presence in a Sherry cask. I don't think this one is colored. Uh, but a little bit about McCollin, even though we've featured them on the show before, just so people know. Founded in 1824, they're a Speyside distillery, although they're labeled as a Highland malt. The original name was Elchie's Distillery, which was changed to McCollin Glenlivet in 1892. And there was a lot of distilleries that used the Glenlivet term because it was very popular in the industry. Their water source is the Ring Arm Burn. And they have a substantial amount of, uh, of stills, which you would kind of expect because they're a pretty big uh, operation. So they've got nine wash stills and 18 spirit stills, which is kind of interesting. So double the amount of spirit stills is wash stills. And they produce a whopping 8 million liters or 2.1 million freedom gallons per year. So that's a that's pretty good production. It's not up there with some of the bigger boys like Glenfiddich, but that's a lot of production. It's, good, it's a good amount. This is the uh, sherry expression, as I said, 40% ABV. And, uh, you know, it smells fantastic. It smells like, uh, like orange rind and vanilla, dried fruits. It's almost got like a peated smoke quality to it. Oh, just fantastic. I mean, this is just... Again, one of my favorite uh, whiskeys, and I'll let you, uh, as I sip and make sounds in the background here, Trippy, I'll let you talk about your first beverage of the night. Yeah, everybody just ignore the yum, yum, yummy kind of sounds in the background. Mm -hmm. That's just John drinking his whiskey. Um, so, so I'm drinking one that I've featured before that the label looks a little washed out. There we go. Uh, Oban 14. Uh, like I said, we featured this before, or at least I have. Um, so good. It's, it's one of my absolute favorites. It's kind of a mix of the Highland style and the, a little bit of the Isla influence, um, a little bit about Oban. Uh, they were founded in 1794. They make a kind of minuscule 670,000 liters, which is only 177,000 freedom gallons. That's not a lot. That is not very much whiskey. And they've only got two stills. Uh, and... Another, the, the one last interesting thing about Oban is that the distillery was there before there was even a town. They built the distillery kind of uh, in a, in a, near a port where people fished, but it wasn't really a populated place. Um, and then a couple years later, the town was actually founded and, you know, sprouted out from there. I almost wonder if uh, the reason they put it at the port was to move their whiskey around because I know, you know, certainly a couple hundred years ago, good luck moving a cask of whiskey from one place to another. You really kind of had to move it by boat. So yeah, that was the fastest way to move anything. Yeah. Um, at least in, in decent quantities. I mean, you could put a couple barrels on a horse or a, a carriage, um, but those are very slow and you can't move a lot of product that way. Yeah. And 1794 was a very long time ago. That was a long time <laughs> ago. I'm glad that the town f sort of sprouted up around the whiskey distillery. That's kind of my style. Yeah, exactly. Go where the whiskey is. 
It's like, well, I got to live somewhere, so might as well live right next to that distillery. Absolutely. So, a reminder to our audience, you're tuned in to Sharing Our Pairings, episode 104, Sober Mesa and Whiskey. We're pairing the Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust Sober Mesa with some uh, Scotch whiskeys and other whiskeys tonight. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon, joined by my co-host, Trippy Trent. We are broadcast live around the world, picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Of course, you can tune in at CigarFederation.com, YouTube.com, and now Facebook Live. Thanks to all our podcast listeners out there. You guys are all over the world. I kid you not. There's like 90 different countries around the world. I keep seeing them pop up. I mean, I just saw Mexico pop up today. So maybe someone's down there on vacation, or maybe there's some locals that are listening. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate all our listeners out there. You can get your questions in at Facebook. You can get your questions at CigarFederation.com. And you can also get your questions in on YouTube. We appreciate those questions. We'll get to those later. But just a reminder that Sharing Our Pairings is brought to you by Gurkha Cigars, makers of the finest cigars in the world. Check out the Heritage or the new Heritage Maduro. Talk to your local B&M. They'll hook you up. They'll find a Gurkha that's right for you. Support your local B&M people. Support your local B&M. And while you're at it, go to the CRA, CRA.org. Sign up for the CRA. Support the CRA, the Cigar Rights of America. I'm a Canadian, and I support the rights of Americans as well because it, it's, it's one big community. But getting back to what we're talking about, which is delicious whiskey. And I'm surprised that this delicious McCollin 12 does not in any way, shape, or form run over this cigar. So talking about Pocomas Intensa, that just goes to show you how intense this cigar is because normally a sherried whiskey is pretty dominant on the palate. And instead what I find is because there's a little bit of spice on the whiskey, it's bringing out more of a sweetness quality from the cigar, which, I, you know, I am getting some sweetness, but it's more intense with the background note of that whiskey. I get that wonderful um, lemon, orangey rind quality to it, which again serves to sort of intensify some of the earthy notes in the cigar and some of that creaminess. Um, it's, I mean, it's kind of like a desserty quality. It's kind of like pairing a dessert wine with a steak to me. Like it's, it's the whiskey here is really serving up to do a lot for the cigar. I wouldn't say the cigar is doing a lot for the whiskey, but I'm okay with that. Cause I kind of wanted to highlight the cigar tonight. How is your, uh, how's your pairing going so far? Great. Uh, so I, I don't have the, a, a nose quite like you do, but I like to smell stuff. The smell of Oban to me mm-hmm. reminds me of like sweet ocean side like it's kind of there's hard candy in there and a little bit of like um, maybe caramel but then you get kind of that brininess smoky uh that makes me think of isla really but yeah uh but you know it just kind of brings to mind a a port with a bunch of sailors smoking cigars maybe or something um but just kind of that smoky quality that i really like yeah Uh, i mean I mean, not to run over your descriptor, but, and you kind of got me there. Like I imagine this big bonfire on the beach at this Mm -hmm. port with, you know, fishing boats going by, seagulls, waves rolling up and that combination of that salt and the smoke and the cigar smoke. I'm right there. Yeah. And so a reason that I didn't even think about that these pair really well together is both of these have kind of every like the Sober Mesa has pretty much every flavor characteristic you could have in a cigar. <laughs> it really uh, does. It hits spicy, it hits sweet, it hits earthy. Uh, it's got a little bit of like saltiness. It's got a little bit of sour. It's got everything. And Oban is the whiskey embodiment of that kind of, uh, that kind of flavor profile where it's just got a little bit of everything. Um, and it's not that it's super well-rounded. You're getting some flavors a lot more than others. Uh, but you are, you're just getting a little bit of everything, which is kind of nice. Um, and that's what I really like about both of these things, Silver Mason and Obama. I think they go together really well. Yeah, I think so too. And talking about, cause I'm, uh, maybe a half inch in three quarters of an inch in and the cigars kind of changed a little bit, evolved to, Give me a little bit more of that chocolate, you know, like it's a, mm-hmm. what I've gotten off this Silver Mace is a little bit of powdered cocoa. And I love powdered cocoa because it kind of reminds me of like cocoa in a, the cocoa flavor I get in an oatmeal stout where it's just, it's not overpowering the entire beverage. It's not taking over. It just serves as an accent note to all of the other flavors that are going on. And I think, you know, again, we've talked about it. That is really what this cigar is. There's no flavor that just like, it's not a spice bomb. It's not a sweet bomb. It's not a smoke bomb. It's not an earth bomb. They're all kind of nuanced and balanced together. And as you said, it just, it walks you right around the flavor map, which I dig. 
Yeah, I really like it. And you mentioned the CRA. So an interesting thing, I went last Thursday, we didn't have a cigar chat guest. So I went to a local uh, whiskey pairing, uh, which is not a big thing around here. Uh, it does not happen very often. Uh, a guy at Kells. Me sad. I know. I know you've been to Kells, right? I think the so. last time you were in Portland, which was years and years ago. Or have you not been to Portland? I don't remember. I don't remember either. No, I, you know what? I, <laughs> I think I think the only places I've been in Washington are Seattle and then whatever that little town is north and east of Seattle on the way towards the Vancouver border. Spokane. Nope. Although nope. I have been to Spokane. I don't know. It doesn't um, matter. It's not relevant to the story. Carry on. It's not relevant to the story, yes. So anyway, we went to Kells, which is an Irish whiskey or an Irish bar downtown. Um, that specializes in whiskey and they've got a crazy selection and they have a cigar room downstairs. They're one of the like maybe five places in Portland proper that you can actually sm- sit down and smoke a cigar and have a drink, um, which are becoming less by the day. Yeah. Uh, but a guy set up a whiskey pairing there. So they did an Irish whiskey tasting that was four different Irish whiskeys. Oh, and I actually yeah. met my local CRA rep that I didn't know we even had like a CRA ambassador around here. Wow. Uh, but he goes around and kind of, you know, preaches the CRA word and he's doing events now and stuff. And he's just a volunteer who's, who's passionate about, you know, tobacco rights, which is good. I mean, they're fighting for your rights. They're fighting for my rights. I mean, the rights of Americans trickle down to trickle up to Canada. It's the same thing. Yeah, I mean, sure do. Yeah. All this stuff affects all of us. We're one big community. So yeah, that's our, that's our ad, our free ad for CRA. Go to CRA.org, sign up. You can, you can reference us if you want, but really we just want to make sure you sign up. But, uh, as much as I'm enjoying this pairing, I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited to move down the line. I mean, I could stay here all night and finish off my short Churchill and nurse it to the very end. But I'm kind of excited to go on to my next one because uh, we start to get it in for me for the Islay whiskeys. And that's, that's kind of where I want to be tonight. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's where I am. So Scotch malt whiskey society. We'll talk about that in a second. This is uh, 3.217, and this is the Delicatessen Shopping Basket. It says, uh, Feast of Prosciutto Ham, Sun-Dried Tomatoes, Sushi and Brown Sauce, Leather Jackets and Canvas Bags with Tobacco. Hey, yeah. German Peppered Ham, a delicious foodie dram in a, w- a warm plastic box, a blast of tar, sea spray, and wet Hessian rope. I don't know what Hessian <laughs> rope is, but uh, and this has uh, been aged in a refill x sherry butt cask. As with all Scotch and Malt Whiskey Society bottlings, it is cask strength, single cask. It is not vatted. And this bad boy is 16 years old. It was distilled in uh, September 1997, 20, 25th of uh, September. And it is uh, one of only 609 bottles coming in at a whopping 55.6% because that's how we roll on sharing Oof. our pairings. She's a beast. Now, I'm going to hold this up. This is uncolored, unfiltered. Look at that color. That's I a mean, beautiful that whiskey. Is, that is sherry right there. Oh, and I mean, I don't even, I, I can't even begin to describe the nose here. It's just got that that wonderful smoky, fishy combination, that sea salt. There is uh, there is definitely that stewed fruit that I tend to get from sherry casks. But uh, I'm going to taste it because at 55.6%, it's going to it's gonna take my palate a little bit to get adjusted. So uh, why don't you talk about your second beverage while I get acclimated here? I will. So this is uh, something that I I didn't know if I'd ever actually get to on sharing our pairings. It's a bottle that I've had for a couple of years. Um, this is High West Distillery's The 36th Vote, and it is a barreled Manhattan. Ooh. So uh, if you've heard of High West, they're in Utah. The 36th Vote comes in because Utah, I haven't looked too much into the history of this, but I know that the delegate for Utah <clears throat> specifically wanted to be the final vote that repealed prohibition. Mm. And so pretty much this, the day that Pennsylvania voted to repeal, uh, their representative or their delegate went in and voted immediately so that he could have been the vote that made the difference. Wow. Um, and so in, in, sort of commemoration of that what they've done here is they take one of their rye whiskey blends so they say that they don't disclose the blend but it's the blend of some of their rye whiskeys uh then they mix in vermouth and a little bit of bitters 
to make it a Manhattan. And then they put that in a second use uh, rye barrel. What, what that means is that it's a barrel that was previously used for, for rye and then used again for rye. And then they use it for the uh, Manhattan. <clears throat> I can dig it. Yeah. So this comes in at a surprising 37% alcohol, which um, vermouth does not have very much alcohol in it. But this this definitely, uh, I think they definitely start a little higher than 40 ABV to make this. Um, and while I don't know when it was distilled or anything, I know that it was bottled on December the 18th of 2015. Um, so I guess I've had it about a year and a half, probably. Time to uh, get after it. Oh, yeah. And it's it's kind of nice. I love Manhattans, but it's kind of nice having a Manhattan that you just pour into a glass and drink. <laughs> you don't have yeah. to do any work for this thing. It's it's just ready for you. And the flavors just marry together so much more than a Manhattan you just made. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottling that I've got here while you take some sips. So uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society is in the United States. It's in Canada. It's around the world. It's the world's largest private club. Uh, they also have the world's largest selection of single cask, single malt whiskeys. And uh, essentially all the products they have are one-offs. So they go into a distillery, they buy a cask, that cask becomes them, and they, theirs, they bottle it and they <coughs> sell it to you. It's, it's a great opportunity to try products from distilleries like, you know, I know Steve loves Lagavulin, and if you have a Lagavulin from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, it's not going to taste like any other Lagavulin you've ever okay. had because it's, it's a one-off, unique product. The good news is it's unique. The bad news is once you drink it, it's gone. So it keeps you coming back. And uh, they've got a range of over 130 distilleries. I think last time I checked, 132, many of them being closed distilleries, which is kind of cool. And this is the 3.217. So 3 is the distillery code. They can't, because the it's not being released from the distillery, they can't release the distillery name on the bottle. But I can because I'm a consumer. So distillery code 3 means it comes from Bamore. And I'm a big fan of Bamore. Bamore is easy drinking. Bamore and cigars, I mean, kind of an awesome pairing to they go hand in hand. And this is uh, dot two one seven, which means this is the two hundred and seventeenth bottling that they've done. So that's substantial. Wow. That's a lot yeah. of barrels from Bomore. That's a lot of barrels from Bomore. And and not surprising because you know, Bomore is popular, Bomore is tasty. It's it's a pretty good representation of an Isle whiskey. a um, little bit about Bomore. They were founded in seventeen seventy nine, so that's pretty pretty long time ago. They produce two million liters of spirit a year, which is uh five hundred and twenty eight thousand freedom gallons. So that's pretty good amount especially for an Islay distillery they are located on Islay. uh however the records so open in 1779 but of course no one really kept records in 1779 of who was open you know there was issues of taxation there was issues of trying to dodge the government so the records aren't necessarily clear about exactly when it opened but they say 1779 uh they were bought out by the beverage giant Suntory by an acquisition of another company that already owned Bamore in 1994 so Suntory of course big Japanese uh spirit company owns like dozens of or a half dozen part of me scotch distilleries now and produce their own whiskey in japan um yeah that's that's all i have to say about that how's the tasting of that first uh first couple of sips going for you fantastic uh <clears throat> i mean it tastes like a manhattan that you would get in a, a real nice bar uh, they nice. don't say what kind of vermouth they use um but i mean it just tastes like a top shelf manhattan uh okay. it's got a lot of uh cherry notes which I I don't think there's any cherry added to this, but you know you normally drop a cherry into a Manhattan, yeah. um, but there's a lot of like cherry vanilla and then just a lot of sweetness. That's what I kind of like about a uh, Manhattan is that it's really just a sweeter version of bourbon, uh, which kind of just makes it you know pleasant to drink when you're out at a bar and you don't want to get just straight whiskey and drink that all night. Mm -hmm. um, there was something I was going to say about Balmore. Oh, so th there's a book called, oh, the name's escaping me now. It's written by Ian Banks, who's a sci-fi writer, and he was contracted to write a book about the best distillery in Scotland. And so basically he just went and traveled around Scotland for a couple months, went to every single distillery he could find and sampled everything he could. 
And in the end, he decided Bowmore is the best distillery in Scotland, which I'm not sure I would agree with exactly. Um, but for uh, for the wider palate, I think it is. Uh, it's not. It's going to be for almost everybody yeah. because it's it's again kind of like Oban. It's an approachable Isla whiskey. Now, I've always kind of described Oban as the gateway to the Isla whiskeys because for me, it's a smoky quality rather mm-hmm. than a peated quality, like in the Bamora that I've got now. And the thing about peat is you need to understand the longer that it's in a barrel, the less the peat has an influence on the spirit. The peat's going to go away over time. So drinking a 16-year-old Bamora, the peat has definitely fallen a little bit off the intense scale, if you, especially if you compare it to like a Lafroy or a Lagavulin. But it's still got a lot of intensity to it. Um, that that smoky quality is still there. Tons of sherry influence. And again, I was really worried about these sherry whiskeys running over the cigar. But that is 100% not the case at all. I find that the cigar, even though it comes across as balanced, it's still got that strength. It's not being run over by this whiskey. I get a lot of pepper spice from this from the sherry here, especially um, on a on a whiskey that's been spent this much time in a sherry. But it's got a lot more pepper and spice than the McCollin. But even with that, it still just serves to to really amplify that sweet, creamy quality in the cigar, and and you know again plays off the cigar. Now I would say at this point the intensity of the whiskey is starting to match the intensity of the cigar, so they are playing off of each other. But before I talk more about that, I just remind our audience that you're tuning in to Sharing Our Pairings, episode 104, Sober Mason Whiskey. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon. I'm joined by my co-host, as always, Trippy Trent, and we are broadcast live around the world and picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Thanks to all our live listeners. Thanks to everyone who tuned in via podcast. I appreciate you guys out there listening on your drive to work. So I listen to my podcasts. I, I don't tend to watch a lot of live shows, even though I do a live show. I like to listen on the way to work. How's uh, how's our audience doing, Trippy? Do we got uh, uh, good? I was actually questions? just going to mention, like the the next time you cut to me, I was going to mention that we've got Dave Burke, our buddy from the Cigar Jukebox, watching on Facebook. He says it's looking great down there in Australia. Nice. Dave Dave is a good friend of the show. If you don't listen to his show, his little plug for Dave, our friend at Cigar Jukebox, search out Cigar Jukebox. He does kind of a unique thing in the industry that nobody else does. Instead of pairing with spirits, instead of pairing with anything else, Dave pairs with music. And his podcast is really music-centric, so he picks a cigar, pairs it with tracks. He has industry guests on. Really great podcast, really great guy. We've been on the show. Uh, definitely subscribe to Cigar Jukebox if you haven't already. Yeah, and I believe he had a new episode come out today with Skip Martin talking about the uh, the new Tribe Called Quest album. Oh, yeah. Uh, I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm really excited to listen to that episode. That would be a great episode. Uh, so anyway, I feel like this isn't quite as good of a pairing as the Oban. The Oban, I feel like the the whiskey brought out a lot of the uh, the earthy flavors of the cigar, and the cigar brought out a lot of sweetness in the Oban. Uh, this one... I think the sweetness is kind of competing with the cigar a little bit. That's a bit of a drag. But yeah. what can you do? What can you do besides move on to our next pairing? That's right. Now, do we have any audience questions queued up at CigarFederation.com, YouTube.com, or even Facebook Live? We do not. Uh, no no real questions. Uh, a couple comments. It's a heater. That's what Bob says about the... Uh, it's a heater! Your your first malt whiskey society. Um, that's course, that, about it. That phrase is uh, coined by Bill Burr. Bill Burr also runs a podcast, which is much bigger than ours. And if you haven't tuned into <laughs> Bill Burr's podcast, you should. Um, it is definitely a heater. It is um it is a beast. But again, you know, this cigar does a great job of standing up to this whiskey. It's it's got a ton of spice. In fact, I'd say the spice intensity from the sherry is almost as intense and maybe even more intense than the peated smoke. But it's good. It's it's a great pairing. Um, I th- I would kind of put this on the same track as a Lagavulin Distillers Edition. A lot of similar quality there. It's a big whiskey, especially at cask strength. There is a lot of oiliness there, which helps I think with the with the cask strength. Now you know if you do want to water your whiskeys down, totally understandable. I mean, a lot of people can't drink whiskey above fifty percent because it kind of blows the palate out. I'm kind of hardcore. I'm a bit of a you know whiskey holic, so I tend to like my whiskeys on the fuller side. But there's certainly no shame in watering it down to 45 or below, and you might find that you get a little bit more flavor, a little bit more nuance. I'm not going to do that because that's just not how I roll. What I am going to do is roll right into my next whiskey pairing. 
and it's another Islay whiskey. Oh, pardon me. It's not an Islay whiskey. It's near Islay. So this is the 31.27, which uh, we've had on the show many, many times, and uh, we're going to have it again because it's delicious. This is the Bold Sailor's Dram, and it says, The nose has sea breezes, seaweed, oyster shells, and beach barbecues, but also medicinal elements, good wood, and reasonable sweetness. The palate's maritime flavors are joined by citrus, oak, ash, white pepper, coal dust, mmm, coal dust, sweet tobacco, heather smoke, and barbecued meat and shellfish. Well, that sounds good to me. This is a 25-year-old whiskey. 25 years old. Wow. First first bottle distilled, uh, pardon me, distilled in uh, September of 1988. One of only 245 bottles. And really the reason for that is because the longer you go with a whiskey, the less you're going to get in a cask. So they only got 245 bottles out of this. It is cask strength, and this is a whopping... 52.4%, 52.4%, which is pretty impressive after 25 years. This is yeah. entirely a refill ex-bourbon hogshead. So I don't know what the bourbon company it was that they used the hogshead from, but it's totally bourbon. Now, that is reflected in the fact that this is not colored. So it is kind of that straw gold color. And you're going to find that out of an ex-bourbon hogshead. Even with a lot of time, it's not going to take on that amber quality that you would tend to get out of a uh, sherry. So it's uh, very subtle, very nuanced, but not on the nose. Boy, do you get the medicinal quality on the nose, I'll tell you. I mean, it's, it, you know, a lot of people are turned off by that medicinal funk, but I kind of like it. And that's the first note I get. Underneath that is definitely that oyster seashell quality. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some sippies here while you talk about uh, your third and last beverage tonight. Yeah. Um, so I, I also went the Isla route this time. Um, or rather, I went the Isla route. I guess you didn't for this one. Um, but it's always weird talking about Isla whiskeys because the flavor notes always sound so bad. Yeah. They coal like, dust. yeah, coal dust, seaweed, medicinal. They sound terrible. And it's definitely an acquired taste. But once you acquire that taste, there's nothing else like it. Um, so I've got the kind of classic Isla, which is Laphroaig 10. Um, I need to pick up some more Laphroaig. I've only got the 10 right now. Um, and to go back over what I've gone over before with Laphroaig, uh, they were founded in 1815, so they just had their 200th anniversary a couple years ago. Nice. They make a whopping 2.6 million liters per year, which is 700,000 freedom gallons. Uh, that's quite a bit of whiskey. Uh it clocks in at 43% ABV, which is kind of the, as we've talked about, it's kind of the typical uh, point for scotches. Um, and it's, again, ex-bourbon barrels. Uh, my light is not as good as yours, but it's still got that kind of straw quality that you get from an ex-bourbon barrel. Uh, what I've been told about this whiskey from one of their, uh, I don't remember what his title is, Master of Malt, I think it is. They have silly titles for all their representatives. He's basically a, uh, a traveling representative who goes around and does events. You've probably met him, uh, Simon something. But he, he goes around and he does whiskey events, and he says the average age of Lefroy 10 is typically about 17 years. Wow. Um, but, of course, 10 is the minimum. So everything that comes in this bottle is at least 10 years old with reportedly an average of 17 years old. Wow. So I'm going to go ahead and take a couple sips here. And what do you think of that, uh, that Isle of Jura? It's a beast. And I talked, uh, prior to the show about what my order was going to be. And I was worried that the Bamor was going to be a lot more peated, but it is, but this, uh, this whiskey, this last whiskey is a lot more of that sort of classic Isla, even though it's not an Isla whiskey, it's the Isle of Jura, and that is from the distillery Jura, which is on the Isle of Jura, a very tiny little island, but it is located very, very close to Isla. But they have their own interesting, unique flavor profile, and it is more that medicinal quality, more that sort of classic smoke and iodine and briny. Like there's a lot of brininess here, even f- far more than the Bomora, and that's amazing at 25 years because you would think those elements would kind of drop off a little bit. But I'll talk a little bit about the uh, distillery. So this is uh, distillery code 31, which, as said, is Jura. 
They've only had 27 bottlings when this was bottled of Jura, so not a lot because Jura is quite small and they don't tend to do a lot of off-cask bottling. So <coughs> nice nice to get my hands on this bad boy. Uh, 25 years, as I already said. And uh, they say it's got, kind of, they call it kind of a Highland Island profile. So it's kind of north of the Highlands, which, you know, it's pretty accurate, but it's on an island. And they call it lightly peated, which is interesting because it does have a lot of smoky peat, especially at 25 years. I'm surprised at how much is still left. A um, little bit about Jura. They were, the, the new Jura, and I'll talk about that, was only founded in 1963, but they still managed to pump out 2.2 million liters of spirit, which is roughly 538,000 freedom gallons, roughly. Um, there was original Jura distillery that stood on the island, but there was a bit of a, a land dispute that went on for a while, which led to the dismantling of the distillery over that land dispute in 1901. So it wasn't until uh, 1963 until they rebuilt the Jura distillery, which is kind of a shame because, you know, it would have been nice to have the, the distillery open all that time and have all that nice old whiskey waiting for us. But it is, like I said, very located near the island. Now, this is another acquisition where um, it was owned by White and bought by White and McKay. And then White and McKay was uh, purchased by the United Spirits Company. So, again, ordered, owned by a huge, huge multinational drink corporation. Um, but it hasn't hurt the quality of the spirit. I'm a big fan. Jury, you can you can tell on the shelf. They've kind of got almost like uh, if you if you ever look at body wash, the the shape of a body wash bottle where it kind of goes in and that out. That hourglass shape. It, the hourglass shape, and they're one of like you've you know not reflected in this because this is a Scotch malt whiskey bottle. And this is pretty typical bottle shape, and they're sort of a short stout bottle with the uh, wavy lines like an hourglass. So very prevalent, and like I said, I love Jura. They're great whiskeys. The uh, Flavor here is very different than the first two whiskeys because it isn't sherried. It is more of a pure Islay style of whiskey, again, with that brininess, the saltiness. And I'm going to have to take a couple more sips here and get my head around it because it is a bit of a beast. Um, I haven't really wrapped my palate around it just yet. How's, uh, how's those first couple sips of Laphroaig going? I just love Laphroaig. I feel like it's it's just got so, much, so many layers of complexity mm-hmm. um, that... If you haven't had it before, the first few times you have it, it's just like smoky gasoline. I mean, it yeah. tastes so strong. But once your palate kind of acclimates to the peatiness, you start to taste the layers that are under that. And it's kind of, uh, it's actually a lot of, uh, very similar to what uh, you said about the Isle of Jura, which is kind of oily, iodiney, really, really smoky. Um, I get a ton of like kind of campfire flavors, which are hard to describe. But now that I think about it, it's kind of like charcoaly, um, definitely smoky. Creosote. Creosote, yes. Uh, which, I mean, again, it it sounds terrible, but once you acquire a palate for it, uh, Laphroaig Ten is just kind of like a a standard solid scotch. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, the tan. I'm a big fan of the core cask if you can get your hands on it. Mm-hmm. And you know, again, the the issue is that if you have a longer age statement Lafroig, that that peaty quality that you know I love, and it's not really heavily peated. Like I think the the PPMs, the phenols per million in that is like below 45. So it's really yeah, I believe it's peated. 45. Yeah, it's not it's not really heavily peated, especially next to some of the monsters in the market. But because it's so young, that peat quality really is a lot more to the forefront i think yeah and and the older whiskeys the 18 the 25 are worlds different i mean they're you don't get as much of that pd quality at all um it's really it's really kind of interesting how it it almost tastes like completely different whiskeys when you're looking at those kind of older expressions so back to this older expression of jura I'm reminded of why I bought this in the first place, because once you kind of get past that iodine medicinal quality, there is this really nice bourbon sweetness underneath that. And the bourbon notes from an ex-bourbon whiskey, I tend to find it's got a lot of delicate uh, uh, stone fruit, like uh, pears and pineapples, um, you know, sometimes a little bit of apple note. And those are very subtle notes from ex-bourbon. 
that can be very easily run over by peat smoke and you know that briny quality but once once your palate sort of acclimates because there is like i said the the brine here is absolutely to the forefront i am starting to get those really sweet <clears throat> fruity notes and uh, it's still pairing really well with the cigar. I'm surprised the cigar is not running over those subtler notes in the in the whiskey. I think it's kind of going to show what the range of pairing options are for the cigar. I think the Mi Corita would be a very different story because it is a little bit rougher, a little bit more earthy and, and, and chewy, a little bit more leathery. And this is a lot more elegant. This cigar... To me, pairs in a would pair with a wide variety of whiskeys, highly or not. Um, so, in my opinion, speaking of the Micarita, I think Micarita is blended more towards uh, the bourbon palette mm-hmm. of flavors, and Sober Mesa is blended more towards the Scotch palette of flavors. Um, I could see good. a I could see a Micarita bourbon show in our future. I think we're gonna have to make that so because, you know, I think we're. The subtler, nuanced notes of whiskey, again, you know, even though we're talking about really high-end whiskey, really, uh, some, of the, some of the cases, really high ABV whiskeys, those subtle notes are going to be run over by a really heavy broadleaf cigar. And where bourbon comes in nicely is bourbon is very intense on the flavor, very intense. That corn, that spice that you typically get off of bourbon is an excellent pairing with broadleaf. So, yeah, I, I think we're definitely going to have to have a Mikorita show in the future, but I mean, I can think of a dozen whiskeys off the top of my head that would pair brilliantly with a Silver Mesa, Springbank, Talisker, um, you know, some Glenlivet 15, 18. In fact, the 18 would just be a mad dog with this cigar, I think. Um, because I think the 15 would be really good. The, that 15 French oak in the red mm. box. Oh, man, that would be a good pairing. Because that is the one thing I think, you know, we're talking about all the different flavor notes. The one thing on the short Churchill that I don't get really intense is a lot of cedar. It's there with the creaminess, but it's not a very intense cedar. And I think if you had a French oak whiskey, that that cedary, woody note, that French oak note would get amplified by the cigar. I think so, too. Yeah, that would, that would be a great pairing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try that. So I could definitely drink this. <laughs> this Jura and this... I, I, think, I think this is... It's not a perfect pairing. It's a really, really good pairing. And I like that all three pairings have been very, very different. They're, they're, they're in the same wheelhouse, but they each are bringing their own little characteristic. I think the intensity of this last one is a little bit less th- than the first two because the, the, with it, like I said, with an aged whiskey, you tend to get those notes falling off in intensity. Um, and this is, like I said, a very full-bodied cigar, it doesn't present itself like that, but it does tend to be pretty forefront on the on the um, on the palate. The uh, one thing I will mention on the Sober Mesa that is different than me, Corita, is I noticed the finish on the cigar is very clean. Yeah, super clean. I don't get that lingering because it is a habano wrapper. I'm not getting a lot of like you know with a lot of habano Ecuadorian habano, I might get a lot of spiciness post drop. I'm getting really just a little bit of sweetness in the center of my tongue post-draw. I'm not getting any leather. I'm not getting any earth, no dirtiness, no loaminess. It's just a nice, clean palate finish, which I think, again, just you know speaks to the volumes it would pair with uh, a variety of whiskeys. So we do have a question from the audience now. Bob Langmaid wants to know, Thank you, Bob. what would be your best guest pairing with the short Churchill? If you had to pick anything, what do you think the best pairing would be? See, my head immediately went to Japanese whiskeys because, of course. you know, like a Yamazaki 18, uh, Miyagikyo might be interesting. Um, I kind of want to, I kind of want to pivot to a Lagavulin Distillers Edition now because I know that that's, you know, one of Steve's favorite whiskeys. And I feel like this is a cigar that's really designed to be paired with a Lagavulin Distillers Edition. I absolutely um, agree. Yeah. I, I feel like those flavors just go together so well. Yeah. I think this is really a cigar, you know, that is that can be paired with a variety of different styles of whiskey. But if you are into peated whiskey, peated whiskey is the way to go. It's not going to run the cigar over. The peat is going to is going to match and complement all the flavor profile here. So I think at the end of the day, you know, if you stick in the Talisker Oban, uh, you know, Port Charlotte. Uh, even an Ardbeg might be a really interesting pairing with this Silver Mesa. 
Oh, an Ardbeg would be a good choice. Mm-hmm. A little Perpetuum, a little Cory Corey Reckon. Might be really interesting pairings. And I also have to thank Bob and Dave for the compliments on the, the Boneyard beer hat, which is a, uh, a local... A it, it, it's a local uh, brewery. They don't... I don't believe they bottle anything. I think everything is in kegs, but they're very prevalent around these parts. Uh, mm-hmm. Pretty much every bar you go into, or every tap house at least, has something from Boneyard on tap. So I think we're going to go through the, the pairings tonight and kind of rate them, because we kind of started that last week, and I think it's kind of fun. I like this. So going back to the McCollin 12, I would say that's a good standby pairing if you're looking to pair and you're not a huge whiskey drinker. Uh, McCollin 12 sherry cask, no-brainer. I'd put that around an 82-83. That is, I would pair it. I wouldn't necessarily uh, reach for it in the sense that I'm not going to plan my night around it, but if I'm reaching for a whiskey and I can't think of something, McCollin 12 and a Sober Mesa Short Churchill, pretty easy pairing, can't go wrong. Um, and I'm going to go with the Oban. I think the Oban, just the, uh, as we talked about how well balanced it is, just like the cigar, I think it goes perfectly with this cigar. Um, they kind of bring out flavors in each other that you wouldn't normally notice. Um, and it's just, it's, it's almost like they were made for each other. I think a Lagavulin might be a little better, but, uh, the Oban for the, the pairings tonight is the winner for me. How would you, uh, so you, wh- if you were to give that a rating scale out of our 100 point scale like we do for cigars, where would you put that? I would put that at, oh, that's pretty high. I would put that at about a 91. Uh, I think it was just a, a fantastic rating. pairing. Moving into our second pairing of the night, uh, I went with the Bomore. And to me, Bomore is always a good standby if you are into the Isla style peated whiskeys. Bomore and cigars have always been a good combination. Uh, I think that's much, much higher on my scale. I'd give it an 87, 88. There's a huge variety of Bomores that would go well with the Sober Mesa. So for me, that's an 87, 88 pairing. Uh, you mentioned that the second pairing of the night with your uh, Manhattan was not the best. Where would you, uh, where would I, you put that on the scale? I would probably put that one around an 82. Uh, I think, I didn't think about it at the time, but I think that pairing the... Uh, the High West Manhattan with a Mikarita would be a way better mm. pairing, or or even the uh, the Umbagog. Actually, now that you now that you say that, I can see an old fashioned going really nicely with that Mikarita because of that bourbon oh, base. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, last pairing of the night was uh, the Isle of Jura. Now, I like it; it's very very good. But I'm going to have to dock at a couple points because I just feel like. The whiskey itself at 25 years is a little too nuanced to go with this cigar. If it had more peaty quality, more briny quality, uh, if it was you know down around 15, 16 years, it would probably stand up a little bit better to this cigar and, and support the cigar a little bit better. So for me, I'd say my last pairing of the night is probably an 85, 86. Very enjoyable, but I'm not going to reach for a 25-year-old whiskey with a silver mace. I'm going to go with something that has a little bit more oomph. Uh, for me, the Lafroy, I think I would go probably an 88. I think it was a good pairing, um, but it didn't bring out as much of the flavor of the cigar as I hoped it would. And what do you think about a, like a Lafroy quarter cask versus the 10? Cause they're kind of different, different quality and spirit. I think the quarter cask might run over the cigar a little bit because the, the quarter cask is a pretty intense whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. It's got a, just a ton of that bourbon character. Um, and I think the quarter cask would actually go better with like a Mikarita. We're definitely gonna have to do a Mikarita show. Oh, well, we bourbon, have to. Maybe, maybe, uh, bourbon cocktail. I think that'd be a no brainer. So before we wrap it up for the night, uh, any other questions, comments, input from the audience? Uh, no. Quiet audience tonight. Yeah. Quiet audience. Everyone's watching the playoffs or something. So, of course, tomorrow night in Cigar Chat, we're going to have our special guest, uh, Claudio Segroy from Mombacho Cigars. That'll be a good show. Always fun to have him on the show. Uh, Claudio's palate is outstanding. I'm sure he's probably going to be drinking a, uh, not a lager. Gosh, what does he always drink? I always try to think of a Pilsner. Thank you. Yeah. He does love his Pilsners. I'm not a, a huge Pilsner fan, but uh, Claudio is a huge Pilsner fan, so I suspect there's a pretty good chance he might be cracking a Pilsner in a Mombacho tomorrow. 
So you can make sure to tune in that at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at CigarFederation.com, YouTube.com, and Facebook Live. That'll be a good show. And then uh, next week we'll have to do another pairing show. I don't know what we're going to have on deck. Uh, we also have uh, John Huber on Tuesday, I believe. Uh, prob- potentially. Uh, he's not 100%, uh, so I don't want to put that out there yet. But uh, I think so. We're going to have him next week almost for sure. Stay tuned to our event calendar at CigarFederation.com. If you click on events at the top. We do have a guest the following week, though, actually. We do have a guest the following week. We have Phil Zangi. Phil Zangi, debonair and Indian motorcycles. I don't think I don't think Phil's been on Cigar Chat for some time. It's I I checked. I think it's been just over a year. I think it was like November of 2015 that he was on. Um, And he's so before I met him, somebody told me. He's the most interesting man in tobacco, mm-hmm. and he really is. He's just got so much to talk about, so many interesting like processes that he's come up with. Um, he's just crazy interesting. I mean, it's it's kind of like um, you know when you have a conversation with Steve Saka, and we've had many conversations with Steve Saka. If you ask Steve about tobacco, you're gonna have about a two hour conversation. Yeah. So with Phil Zangi, I drove, I drove like a, I don't know, hour and a half, two hours to go to an event. Mostly because Pedro was there. Mm-hmm. And I got there and Phil Zangi was there too. And I went over and I just kind of introduced myself. And he had an empty seat next to me. He's like, well, sit down. Just talk to me for a minute. And uh, I talked to him for about two hours. Yeah. Super classy guy. And if you really want to get him into a deep conversation, ask him about boxing. Do you have a mm-hmm. two-hour conversation about boxing? Loves his boxing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, had, we, had a, a, we talked a little bit about boxing and UFC. So that'll be a good show. That'll be in two weeks again on the event calendar. And, of course, we'll paste that on YouTube. We'll paste that on Facebook. And get your questions in for any of the, show, any of the shows at CigarFederation.com going to the Cigar Chat page. Thanks for everyone who tuned in tonight and everyone who's listening via podcast. Appreciate your support. Appreciate you enjoying the show. We're coming up on three years this June, if you can imagine. Three wow. years sharing our pairing. The first and only show dedicated to cigar pairing with beverages. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon, joined by Trippy Trent. We are broadcast around the world. I want to take a moment to thank all of our Armed Forces Radio Network listeners who are out there in the world, wherever you're stationed. I hope you're staying safe. You've enjoyed our tomfoolery for this 58 minutes. Have a great weekend. We're going to the Easter weekend, so hopefully you get a little bit of downtime, a little bit of magazine time, write the family, do some uh, do some Skyping, whatever it is you can do. We appreciate your service. You guys are built to do things we are not. As we were saying, sharing our pairings, we want you to drink better, but we want you to drink less.